Well, it is good to be with you this morning. I've been really looking forward to sharing with you. I love being here on Sunday mornings, um, getting to celebrate with just fantastic music and fantastic people like yourselves. But uh, I wanted to start this morning by telling a story about my honeymoon. Uh, when I got engaged, the first thing that I thought about was our honeymoon. I'm a terrible person. I should have been thinking about my fiance, but I was thinking about the honeymoon. I was thinking about it because everyone gets excited for that time where you get to go away with your new spouse, you get to celebrate, usually somewhere pretty tropical, you get to go and lay on a beach and enjoy the sun. So that's what was going through my mind. And so as we started planning out our engagement and our wedding, I told my wife, Janine, I said, listen, I really want to go somewhere really nice and warm. Let's go to a resort. Let's go somewhere tropical. And one of the main reasons I said that is that I had a lifelong dream of going scuba diving. I'd always wanted to do it ever since I was really young. I love being in the water. I love seeing all the incredible things that you do when you're under the water. And so I said, please, 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 can we go scuba diving? So Janae, being the wonderful fiance that she was, she says, okay, we'll, uh, we'll go to a resort. Let's go to Antigua. And they've got some scuba diving there. And you can get certified for a day and you can go out. And so I was like, yes, I've got my one thing. This is going to be good. So we go on our vacation, it's fantastic, it was a beautiful wedding, we're enjoying ourselves, and it comes to scuba diving day, and I'm really, really excited. So we go out, uh, and there's only two couples in the class, there's Janine and I, and then there's one more of the couple, and the husband in this couple uh, looks like Hercules. He's got muscles upon muscles, he's got a 10-pack, I've got a 1-pack, so things are not looking very good. So now, not only am I looking forward to living my lifelong dream of scuba diving, I've got to kind of impress my new wife, right? Because this is the first time that we've got to be together like this, and I don't want Hercules to make me look really ridiculous. So we get in a pool, we've got to swim 10 laps around this, and Hercules turns out to be part dolphin. He's going through it really quickly. So I'm trying my best to keep up, trying my best not to uh, have a heart attack from all the swimming. And we make it through, and we come to use the respirators, the, the device that you use to be able to breathe when you're underwater. And we go in there, and it's fantastic, it's amazing. I'm breathing underwater, it's everything that I thought it could be. Uh, and then Janae gives me a little tap on the shoulder, and she says, Andrew, I don't, I don't feel comfortable, this is, it's a little uncomfortable. I said, well, it's, it's probably just that you've never done this before, you know, it's a strange sensation and a feeling to be underwater and to be breathing while you're under the water, so let's give it one more try, don't worry about it, it's just something new. So she goes under again, she comes up one more time, she gives me one more tap, she says, I really don't feel comfortable, this is making me feel very uncomfortable. So all of a sudden it hits me, I'm going to have to choose between my lifelong dream of scuba diving on my honeymoon or being with my wife on our honeymoon. <laughs> so of course what I said was, will you go back to the room, I'm going to stay here, you know, you have a good time. No, of course I didn't say that, right? Because you don't say that to your wife on your honeymoon, because she'll pull out a knife and she'll kill you. No, you don't say that because when you're on your honeymoon, what you're most excited about, what brings you the most joy in your honeymoon is not getting to do all of the amazing things that you get to do. It's being with the person that you're in love with, being with the person that you've wanted to be here with. And so for me in that moment, even though I was choosing between something that I'd wanted to do since I was younger and then being with Janae, for me it was really easy. And not because I'm a special person, but because when you were with your spouse in that moment, they are so much more precious, they are so much more fun than getting to do anything that you could imagine for yourself by yourself. And that's kind of where we find the Hebrew people this morning when we pick up in our story of them wandering through the desert, wandering through the wilderness with God. We find them in a moment where they're having to choose between their dream, their hope of being in a promised land that God had promised them over 400 years ago, and then now actually being with God and we're going to find out as we start Exodus 33 that the Hebrew people are on the rocks. They're in a little bit of a dark moment. So let me go ahead and read for us Exodus 33, uh, verses 1 through 3. This is what it says. The Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you've brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your offspring, I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. So we pick up here in Exodus 33. We've been following them now for a couple of different weeks, uh, going through this series in Exodus. We've watched them leave Egypt, leave the place where they were enslaved. They, we've watched them go through the desert, and at every turn, God supply for them and take care for them, even as they grumble. 
And now we come and finally they're going to go into the promised land. Finally God chooses the moment to say, we're going in. I'm going to give you what I promised to give you for over 400 years. But he says something that they didn't expect this. And he says something that should shock us. He says, I'm going to send you in, but I'm not going to go with you. And the reason he says I'm not going to go with you is he says because you're a stiff-necked people. And if I go with you, I'm going to end up consuming you. Because again and again, the Hebrews argued with God. They wrestled with God. They didn't like the way he was doing it. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, we heard from Pastor Brian where he told us a story of how God was miraculously providing bread from heaven. And even that caused the Hebrew people to grumble. And if we really want to understand why they're on the rocks in this moment, why things have gotten so bad, we need to jump back just a little bit to Exodus 32 because something really important happened that I don't want to brush by. You see, in Exodus 32, what was happening is Moses was on the mountain with God. He'd gone up the mountain, and he'd been having a conversation with God, and that's what Pastor Jeff has been telling us about the Ten Commandments and the tabernacle. That was part of the conversation that Moses was having up there. God was explaining how he wanted to be with his people, how he wanted to build them a place where he, his presence would dwell in the midst of them, how he wanted to give them a law that would protect them and care for them. But while Moses was on the mountain doing that, the Hebrew people were at the base of the mountain. Uh, and the Hebrew people went up to Aaron, who was leading the camp while Moses was away. And they said, listen, we don't want to wait for Moses to get back. We're sick and tired of watching God do things his way and, and tell us everything that we don't want to hear, making us follow rules that we don't want to follow, setting out ways to go through the wilderness that we don't want to follow. And so we want our own God we want someone who's going to fit our category of what we need. We want someone who's going to be the God that we think that we need. And so what they do is they get together and they bring all their jewelry and they create this idol. They create a, a monument of a golden calf. And what they do is they bow down to this calf and they say, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. They actually go as far as to name that calf Yahweh. They give it the, the very special name that God had given the Hebrew people. They give that name away to this idol, this thing that they'd made with their own hands, this thing that came from their own imagination that wasn't real. And they said, this is the one that's led us through the desert. This is the one that's taken care of us. Now, the reason they do that, is be, as strange as it is to us, to us today, is that because they were so tired of a God that didn't fit what they wanted, they knew they wanted the promised land. They wanted to be their own people. They wanted to be out of captivity to Egypt, and they wanted to have their own home. But they didn't want to get it the way that God was forcing them to get it. They didn't want to follow, follow the path that God was laying out for them. Now, we can look at that story and think that's really strange to, to create a golden calf and worship it. But if we're honest, don't we do that all the time? Don't we get tired of doing things God's way? Don't we get tired of reading the Bible and wrestling with a God that asks us to do things and challenges us to do things that sometimes feel very uncomfortable for us? And don't we then, when we experience that, kind of start creating things out of our own imagination, turning to things that we think will be better for us, and telling ourselves, we don't need this God. We need something that will help me feel better about this situation. How many of us, when we go through suffering and struggle, instead of turning to God, tend to something else instead? Tend to something that's not quite God, but something that helps us feel better, something that helps us feel a little bit more comfortable with the, the trial and the suffering that we're on. You see, they wanted to have a relationship with God on their terms, not on his. They wanted to know God and, and worship a God the way that they wanted to do that, not the way that God wanted to be worshipped. Now, I, I don't know if anybody here uses Amazon Prime, but I'm a big fan of Amazon Prime. I like using Amazon Prime because you can, you can find anything that you could possibly want on Amazon. Anything at all. And I have a wish list on Amazon. And what a wish list is, is whenever you find something that you want, uh, you can kind of click it and it goes straight into your wish list box. And so if someone wants to get you it to be generous, uh, they can go on there and take a look at what you've been looking at. Uh, now, I am a huge nerd, and so I tend to fill my wish list with things that no one in the world would ever need. To give you some examples, on my wish list, there is a replica Thor hammer from the movie Thor. Uh, there is Jedi robes that cost over $100. I don't know why anyone would need them, but apparently I need them. Uh, and sometimes I'll go to Janae and I'll say, hey, Janae, can I buy my Jedi robes? Can I, can I get my little thing? And she says, Andrew, you're a 30 year old man. Why do you need a Thor hammer? Why do you need Jedi robes? And of course, I tell her, I just need to know what it feels like to be a Jedi. I need to experience the dream. 
Uh, and, and Janae, being a very sensible woman, very uh, good with money, she says, no, we don't need to waste money on Jedi robes. You don't need that. You would never use that. It's just weird. Friends would call us names, so don't do that. Uh, but if I'm very lucky, very occasionally, if I pester Janae enough and I push on her, uh, she'll say, okay, if you want to waste your money on that, you go ahead. If you want to get it, then you can get it. And the instant that she says that, it's like this cloud lifts, and all of a sudden I realize how ridiculous it is. How ridiculous that as a grown man I'm arguing to get Jedi robes or, or whatever else it is that's ridiculous on that list. And you might be able to sympathize with that. You might be able to feel, especially if you're a parent, you've probably seen your kids do this, that when you, all of a sudden you get the freedom to get what you want, all of a sudden things change. All of a sudden you realize how silly you've been, how foolish you've been, and you don't want it anymore. And that's the same thing that happens in this moment. You see, when the Hebrew people are told by God, okay, you can have your promised land. I'll even drive out all of your enemies, all of these different tribes that would harm you. I'll drive them out. I'll send an angel before you. I'll give you exactly what you want, but I'm not going to go among you. All of a sudden, their eyes are opened. All of a sudden, they see how foolish they've been, how silly they've been to argue with God and to keep pushing against him. And they realize if we lose God but we get our dream, then we haven't got anything at all. They realize how precious God is that even in the middle of a desert, even when they're struggling to have food and to find their way through, that even there, as long as they have God, then they have everything they need. That they don't need a promised land. And so even if they get their hope and their dream, if God's not there, then it's no dream at all. Now, I want to pause for a minute as we think about that, and I want to say this, that the kindest thing that God can do to us, the kindest thing that he can say to us is to reveal to us how much more precious he is than all of our hopes and dreams. The very kindest thing, the most loving thing that God could do for any of us is to help us see how much better he is than anything that we could think up for ourselves. Absolutely anything. Now, if that is the kindest thing that God can do, then conversely, the most terrifying thing that God can do is give us exactly what we want on our terms without himself. That's the most scary thing he can do, to give us exactly what we want without himself because he knows how much better he is than all of our hopes and dreams. So if God was to give us everything that we want, knowing it's not the best for us, how terrifying is that? How terrifying a thought is it that we could be handed over to something that we don't really understand to be in a place that we don't really deserve and have to be there without God to take care of us. To be there without the one who's better than all of those things. See, God knows that their expectations and their dreams and their desires, they're a barrier to them understanding him rightly. And so he's doing the most merciful thing he can possibly do, which is help them to see that. And the only way he can help them see that is by saying, you get your land, but you don't get me. Because it's not until that rock bottom moment do the Hebrew people finally understand why God is so much more important than all of those other things. One of uh, the most memorable quotes I've learned as a Christian is by a pastor called Tim Keller. And this is what he says. He says, God will only give you what you would have asked him for if you knew everything he knows. God knows so much more than we do. He's so much more loving than we do that we need to trust that when he says something, it's not because he wants to oppress us. It's not because he wants to cause us harm. It's because he knows something we don't know. It's because he knows that there's something better for us than what we've imagined for ourselves. But you see, it's too little too late for the Hebrew people to really think through this and get this and change because their relationship's been broken. You see, while they were at the base of that mountain doing what they were doing, betraying God and giving his name away to something that they'd created with their own hands, God, of course, was not blind to that. He saw what they were doing. And he says, Moses, we need to stop this conversation, this conversation about tabernacles and uh, law and commandments and grace. We need to stop because my people are at the base of this mountain betraying me. They're forsaking me. They're giving my name away to something that they've made with their own hands. And so Moses comes down from the mountain and he sees it and Moses is so heartbroken over what his, his own brother Aaron has done and what his people, the Hebrews, have done that he takes the Ten Commandments and he throws them and he breaks them on the ground. So all of that work, all of those incredible things that were happening on that mountain as God was writing those Ten Commandments out, all of that's broken and lost because of what the Hebrew people did. 
And so it's too little too late because even though the Hebrew people finally see and understand how much more precious God is than all of their hopes and dreams, they've lost him. Because that covenant, that relationship that they had with him has been broken because they've betrayed him. Essentially, they've said, we want another God. And so God has said, okay, then you have your God. You have it, even though you've made it with your own hands. Even though it's an imaginary God, you can have that, but you can't have me as well. So they've lost him. And so the Hebrew people find themselves between a rock and a hard place. Between finally understanding God rightly, but not being able to have him. So they need someone to try and change this situation. They need someone to come in and save the day, and that's Moses. And this is what happens when Moses goes before God for the people in verses 9 through 15. It says this, that Moses entered the tent, and the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And then jumping ahead just really quickly to verse 12, it says this, Moses said to the Lord, see you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you've said to me, I know you by name and you've also found favor in my sight. Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. And God said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And Moses said to him, if your presence will not go with me, don't bring us up from here. See, Moses is unique. He's special because not only does he, uh, was he not a part of what was going on at the base of the mountain. So he wasn't involved in that, that error and that failure. But Moses has a very special relationship with God and he has this entire time. And Moses, what he would do is he used to go into the tent of prayer, which would be outside of the camp. So you would have all the Hebrew people gathered together, and then outside of that, there would be a special tent where Moses would go and meet with God. And it was on outside of the the camp, because if God's presence would come down in the middle of all the people, it would be too much for them. It would crush them. And so Moses used to go to a special place, away from the people where he could speak with God. And we read something incredible, that God and Moses were so close that God used to come and speak to him as a man speaks to his friend, face to face. How many of us would love that relationship, to be able to go to God face to face and speak with him like a friend? And so you see, Moses has this very special relationship with God. It's so special, in fact, that Moses' relationship with God is going to be a lifeboat for the Hebrew people. Because even though they don't have right standing with God, even though they don't have a relationship with God anymore, Moses does. So Moses can go in to God, and he can speak with them, and he can try and turn this situation around. So how does he do that? How does he deal with the sin of the people? How does he get God and the Hebrew people reconciled back together? Well, he goes in, and the first thing he does, of course, is he says, they're really, really sorry, God. They feel terrible about what they've done. Look at them. They're, they're really sorry. Please give them a second chance. No, he doesn't, he doesn't say that. Does he go in and he says, well, I'm Moses, God. I'm the one that you chose. I'm the special one. So you need to listen to what I have to say. I'm the guy that was at the burning bush. So you need to listen to what I have to say. And what I have to say is that you need to turn back and you need to come to these people. He doesn't say that either. See, what Moses does is he goes in and he doesn't mention anything about the Hebrew people and whether they deserve a second chance or not. He doesn't mention anything about himself and how he thinks that God just needs to listen to him. He goes in and he he intercedes and he prays for the people based on who God is. He goes in and he says, show me your ways, God. Remember that these are your people. What he's doing is he's reminding God of the promises that God had given to him and given to the Hebrews as his people. You see, God had promised all the way back when he was speaking with Abraham. He said, I'm your very great reward. I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. And God had made this really special covenant with Abraham. He'd he'd made a really serious covenant where he said, I'm going to remain with you. I'm going to be faithful to you. I'm going to take care of you. And so Moses is coming and saying, remember, this is what you said, God. This is who you are, God. You're the God who came to us, who came to rescue us. The God who promised to us that you would care for us, that you would be our God, that you'd be our very great reward. 
And that's what we really need if we're going to have an intercessor, if we're going to have someone who's going to bring us back to God. We don't need someone who's going to go in and plead a case for us like a lawyer and try and tell them how sorry we are or how something was mistaken. We need someone who's going to go in and fully acknowledge the fact that we failed but say, it doesn't matter because this is who you are, God. See, even in the midst of all of our failures, the most important thing that we can pray before God is that he would remember who he is, that he is good, not because he's forgotten, but because we have forgotten We need to be reminded of how good God is. Moses was going in there and he was staring himself up by trying to remember this is who God is. I know that God can turn this situation around because he promised that he always would. No matter how bleak it looks, no matter how dark it looks, Moses knew God can fix this. And so when Moses prays, God says, okay, I'll go with you. My presence is going to go with you and I'll give you rest. And then Moses says something that I think is one of the most important lines in all of the Bible. In verse 15, he says, If your presence will not go with me, don't bring us up from here. He says, If you're not going to be in the promised land, if you're not going to stay with us, then we don't want it. We would rather stay in a desert, totally dependent on you, than have our wildest dreams. Something that we've hoped for as a people for over 400 years. We will immediately cash that in to have you instead. Now the reason that I think that is one of the most important things in the Bible is that is the heartbeat of what Christianity is all about. It's not about trying to be a good person. It's not about trying to do all the right things. It's about understanding that God is the most precious thing that we can have. That he's the best thing that we can have. To know God, to have a relationship with him, to know him and be loved by him and to belong to him. That is the most beautiful and precious thing that any human being could ever have. And that's what Moses is understanding here. He's understanding God rightly. He's understanding how precious God is. How much more important God himself is than anything that God could give. It's not about the gifts and the blessings. It's about God himself. And again, that's what we need. We need someone who can pray for us, who can go before God and see God the right way. Understand God as he really is. Someone who's more precious than all of our dreams and all of our hopes. But how can we be sure that this is going to work out? I mean, God seemingly changed his mind here. He said, okay, I'm, I'm going to go with you. But how do we know that things aren't going to go the other way again? Because after all, isn't this a cycle that we've been seeing the whole time that we've been looking at the story of the Hebrew people? Hasn't God forgiven them again and again and every time? they fail, every time they betray him, every time they get angry, every time they mourn and groan. So how do we know that things are not going to end up in the same place again? See, Moses is looking not just that God would forgive them, but God would give them assurance that he can hold this together, that he can make the Hebrew people stick by things. And so what he's going to need is he's going to need the glory of God. He's going to need to see the glory of God so that he can have assurance, so that he can have confidence that God can make this work. And in order to see that glory, Moses is going to have to go into the rock. You see, this is what Moses says when he prays for the people, verses 18 through 23. He says, please show me your glory. And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I'll be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said to Moses, you can't see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And when my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock. And I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shan't see my back. But my face shall not be, you will see my back, but my face will not be seen. See, again, Moses is asking for confirmation. But God's reply is, okay, if you need assurance, if you need something to hold on to, then I'm going to cause my glory to come. You've asked for it, and now you're going to get it. But he says, this is going to be such a terrifying experience for you, Moses. It's going to be so dangerous that you're going to have to hide inside of a rock. Because if you see me, if you see my glory, you're not going to live to be able to talk about it. Why is God's glory so dangerous? Well, in order to understand that, we need to think about two things. We need to think about the weight of glory, and then we need to think about the substance of glory. See, I say the weight of glory because in the Bible, the word glory is a Hebrew word, kavod. And what kavod literally means is weight or heaviness. And whenever in ancient cultures they would talk about glory, 
they would be talking about weight. And a good way to think about this is maybe if uh, the Queen of England, uh, who is a classy lady, by the way, if she came into this place this morning, there would be a weight, there would be a presence that we would all feel when she came in here, right? That when someone of that importance, someone of that reputation came in here, we would feel it. And so that's what these ancient cultures kind of meant when they talked about glory, the glory of a king or a kingdom. They would be talking about the weight of it, the reputation, the presence of it. And in God's case, because he is God, there is no one with a greater reputation, there is no one with a greater presence than God himself. He's so far above anything else in this world. And so a good way to think about God's weight and how heavy he is is something called a neutron star. What a neutron star is, is it's an object in space. It's a regular star that's burned up all of its fuel, just like our sun. So if our sun had run out of all the fuel that makes it burn, it would collapse in on itself. Uh, and some stars are so big, and they've got so much fuel that they collapse, and they, they create this thing called a neutron star. And a neutron star is when things get so uh, compacted and so dense that it becomes extremely heavy because all of that huge space gets compressed into a tiny, tiny space. So if we were to go into space with a space shuttle and somehow manage to get a little bit of a neutron star in a thimble, and we were to bring that thimble back to Earth, that thimble alone of, of matter from a neutron star would weigh millions and millions of tons. It would be so heavy. It would be so heavy that if I was to tip that thimble upside down, the, uh, the neutron star matter would fall straight through the Earth like a bullet because it's so heavy. See, there's things out there that weigh like that, and that is helpful for us when we think about God because God's weight is so far above. God's glory is so great, much greater than anything else in this world that it's kind of like that neutron star, that it's too much to hold, it's too much to bear, it's too heavy. And you see, that's why God is telling Moses, you're going to have to hide in a rock because when I come, it's going to be too much. Uh, there's another passage in the Bible where we can think about this a little bit more, and that's in 2 Chronicles 7. And in that passage, what's happening is King David's son Solomon has built this temple for God. And as the priests pray, God's glory comes into that temple, and it's so heavy that everyone has to get out. They can't even get inside the building because the glory of God filled the house. So God's glory is not this spiritual idea. It's not this thing that we tend to think of in our cultures like a glow or some very spiritual thing. It's a, it's a tangible, physical experience. When God's glory shows up, it's so incredible, so heavy that we can't get anywhere near it. So whenever we talk about the glory of God, it should intimidate us a little bit. We should feel the weight of it, something that's incredibly important, something that's a little bit dangerous. But what makes it so heavy? What makes it so intimidating? Well, then that's when we need to think about the substance of glory. See, what God says is, when I show up, when my glory comes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cause my goodness to pass before you. Moses says, show me your glory. And God's immediate response is, then I'm going to show you my goodness. So there's a little bit of a connection there between God's glory and his goodness. And the word that the Bible uses for goodness is another Hebrew word, tuv. And what tuv means is goodness in its very widest sense. So think of the very best of the very best of the very best. Something that's so pure, something that's so good, it's, it's almost unimaginable. See, when Moses asks to see God's glory, what he's really asking is he's, he's saying, show me who you are. Show me what gives you so much weight. Show me the very essence of who you are, God. And God's answer for that is, I'm going to show you the very best of the very best. I'm going to show you my goodness. Now, I could try and unpack this lots of different ways because it's a very difficult thing to understand, but I think the best way to do it is to get some help from a guy who we hear from a lot in this church, and that's C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis uh, is going to be really helpful because if there's one thing that C.S. Lewis is really good at, it's helping give us a, a picture, something in our mind to try and understand these big ideas. That's one of the reasons I really like him. It's probably one of the reasons Jeff really likes him because he helps us take these really big ideas and he just gives us a simple picture. And there's one book he has in particular called The Great Divorce that I think helps us understand glory. And what The Great Divorce is, it's a fictional story. It's not real. C.S. Lewis is not saying that this is something that he actually experienced or has seen. It's something that he came up with to try and put a story, put an image to the idea of the glory of God. And the book itself is about a group of people who travel. Uh, they go on a bus trip uh, to heaven. You can tell it's very British because they go on a bus trip to heaven. Um, but when they get there, they step off and they experience the glory of God. 
They experience it because the glory of God fills all of heaven. It fills everything that's there. And so I want to read a quick passage that kind of gives us some images and some words to try and understand the glory of God. So this is, as that bus arrives in heaven and everyone steps off, this is what one of the characters experiences. He says, Then some readjustment of the mind or some focusing of my eyes took place, and I saw the whole phenomenon the other way around. The men were as they always had been, as all the men I had known had been, perhaps. It was the light, the grass, the trees that were different, made of some different substance, so much more solid than the things in our country that men were ghosts by comparison. Moved by a sudden thought, I bent down and tried to pluck a daisy which was growing at my feet. The stalk wouldn't break. I tried to twist it, but it wouldn't twist. I tugged till the sweat stood out on my forehead and I had lost most of the skin off of my hands. The little flower was hard, not like wood or even like iron, but like diamond. There was a leaf, a young tender beech leaf, lying in the grass beside it, and I tried to pick the leaf up, but my heart almost cracked with the effort. As I stood recovering my breath with great gasps and looking down at the daisy, I noticed that I could see the grass not only between my feet, but through them. I also was a phantom. Who will give me words to express the terror of that discovery? So what this man experiences, what this character experiences, is when he steps off that bus, everything around him is so much more real than he or any of his friends that have come to heaven is, that they look like ghosts by comparison, that they're almost transparent, because the glory of God that fills everything there in heaven, the trees and the leaves and the grass, is so much more real than who he is, that they look like phantoms by comparison. Now the reason I think that that's a really good image for us to think about is when we think about the goodness of God and the glory of God, what we need to understand that it is more real than we are. And by that I mean that the goodness that is in God is so much more good than we are that by comparison we we look like ghosts. It looks like there's not even really any goodness there because God is so much more good than we are. He's so much more magnificent, so much more beautiful that everything by comparison just does not seem as real as he does. It's a good analogy too because we kind of see what the weight of the glory of God is like in that he's trying to pick this daisy and because the glory of God is even filling that daisy, he can't even pick it up, that it's too heavy for him. And then the best part of that, I think, is that last part where he says, who will give me words to describe the terror of this experience? Now why is he so scared? Why is this character, when he looks on the glory of God and he finds out how real it is, how magnificent it is, why does that scare him? Well, I think it scares him and it gives him terror because to realize that there is something out there that is better than you, that is greater than you, that is so much more good than you are, is is terrifying. And it's terrifying precisely because we are not good. That when we bring all of our goodness and all of our best attitudes and best deeds before God, compared to him, they just don't measure up. Because we could never do anything to measure up to the goodness of God. We could never bring anything of ourselves that would be anywhere close to as as what he deserves because of how magnificent he is. That's a terrifying thing to know that you have nothing to bring before God. Nothing to try and turn him around. Nothing to sway his opinion. That's a difficult thing to wrestle with. But I don't think that we should stay in that place where we're terrified. I don't think that we should stay there and be too intimidated by the glory of God, though it is intimidating, precisely for one reason, and that's because God is good. See, even though that that can be terrifying, thinking about how much greater God is than us, it also gives us assurance that God can take care of us, that God doesn't want harm for us, he wants good for us, because he is good. This is what God says to Moses when he passes by, when all of his goodness comes by Moses, he says, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I'll be merciful to whom I'm going to be merciful. What God is saying is, I am gracious, Moses. I'm going to forgive you, and I'm going to be gracious to you, because that's who I am. I forgive, I'm gracious, I show mercy. It's got nothing to do with you. It's got nothing to do with the Hebrew people. It doesn't matter that you don't have anything to bring to me to try and sway me. I'm still going to forgive you, because that's who I am. So when we think about why is church important, why is Christianity important, why is it good that we are all here this morning listening to these words, we should listen to that moment and we should think the reason why it's so good is that we can come into this building this morning and we can bring our ugliest 
failures. We can bring our darkest moments. We can bring all those parts of ourselves that frighten us, that intimidate us, those things that we feel that we need to hide. And we can come before a God who is good and know that he will take care of us. That even in our very worst moment, that we've got nothing to please him with, he still will be good to us because that's who he is. See, God reconciles us to himself, not because we are good, but because he is. And all the weight of his glory is so important because it outweighs the weight of all of our sin. No matter how heavy all the mistakes and the flaws and the imperfections that we bring to before God, no matter how heavy the burden of all of the pain in our life, God's goodness outweighs that burden. It outweighs it a thousand to one. See, if we think about this really seriously, it's a story about the rock bottom moment of the Hebrews. It's a moment when they are at their very worst, that they've done the worst thing that they possibly could have done, which was to give God's name away to something that they'd created. To rob God of everything that he had done for them. But even in that moment, God shows up and says, I'm going to forgive you because that's who I am. I'm going to take care of you because that's what I promised to do. I am going to love you even though you're unlovable because I love you and there's nothing more to it than that. So if we think about this very carefully, the real rescuer in the story isn't Moses. The one who's doing the interceding and the mediating and the reconciling. In the end, it's not really Moses. It's the glory of God. It's the glory of God because it's the glory of God that comes in the midst of the brokenness and the mess ups and the flaws and says, I'm going to be gracious. I'm going to be merciful. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to reconcile you. And it's not the last time that the glory of God is going to show up to take care of a people who need rescuing and take care of a people who had messed things up. This is what the Bible says about Jesus uh, in the New Testament uh, in a book uh, called Hebrews. It says, He is the radiance of the glory of God in the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And then later in Hebrews chapter 7, it says this, Consequently, he, Jesus, is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. See, Jesus is God's goodness with skin on. Jesus is all of the glory of God come down to live with us, to show us that God is good, to remind us that God is big enough to take care of us. See, Jesus is the full weight of all of God's goodness. And if we are found in him, if we go to him, if we approach God through him, then we're hidden in the rock just like Moses was so that we don't have to be crushed by God's goodness. We can enjoy it. We can be comforted by it. We can be redeemed by it. This is what one of Jesus' closest friends said in the Gospel of John, his best friend. He said, The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Friends, this morning we can come into this place and we can be intimidated by God's glory or we can see his truth and grace. And we can feel that we might be crushed by God's goodness, by how much we don't deserve him, or we can be reminded that his glory outweighs our mistakes. And I can say that to you this morning and I can be convicted about that and have confidence in that because there is no one in this building who is a bigger sinner than I am. There's no one who should be more terrified of, of God than I am because I've done absolutely nothing to make him love me. There's nothing in my life that could make him love me. Yet again and again, God shows up and he does love me because he's good. Because that's who he is. And so let's finish this morning by looking at Jesus, who is all of God's goodness sent for our sake so that we won't be crushed by the goodness of God, so we can be comforted by it, so that we can be redeemed by it. So that even when we betray God, we can still know that he is our very great reward. No matter what we do, no matter what we bring into this building this morning, God will not turn us away. He will not reject us. He will not forsake us in our darkest moments because he lives to make intercession for us. Because he is the one who goes into the tent and prays before God. Jesus is the one who does those things for us every day for all eternity. He's the goodness and the glory of God. Let me pray for us as we finish this morning. 
Father, I thank you for your son. I thank you for Jesus, who is the radiance of all of your glory, the exact imprint of your nature, who lives to make intercession for us. Thank you that he is the one that went into the tent, who went before you when we were broken, when we'd messed up, when we'd made mistakes, and he prayed for us. And he paid the highest price so that we might be protected in him, as Moses was in the rock, so that we could know the goodness of God so that we don't need to be terrified by it, but we can be comforted by it. God, if there are those like myself here this morning who sometimes feel the weight and the terror of all the ways that life has not gone right, all the ways that things in life have uh, gone the wrong direction, God, I pray that you would remind us this morning that you were good enough to care for us, that your glory comes not to crush us, but to rescue us. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I love church. Um, As we go this morning, I want to remind you that there are people who can pray for you. So don't leave this place this morning. If you need prayer, if there's a place where you are feeling discouraged, we want to be there for you. We want to support you. Uh, But let me offer this morning's benediction as we leave. Let's go in the name of the God who is our very great reward, who shows us the glory of his goodness in his son, and who lives to make intercession for us. It's in his name that we go this morning. Amen.